Welcome to UX Research Geeks, where we geek out with researchers from all around the world on topics they are passionate about. I'm your host, Dina Vitkova, a researcher and a strategist, and this podcast is brought to you by UX3, an all-in-one UX research tool. This is the sixth episode of the third season of UXR Geeks. And you are listening to me talking to Daniel and Larissa from Feedly. Daniel is the creator of Atomic UX Research, a method that emphasizes the importance of backing up insights with multiple sources and facts, promoting a data-driven approach to research. Larissa brings her perspective on non-linear research, highlighting its benefits. In this episode, we delve into the core principles of Atomic UX Research, which may seem chaotic at first, but ultimately provides a flexible and structured framework. We explore how organization, including non-researchers, can benefit from this approach. So get ready for an insightful conversation. How are you guys? Not too bad, thank you. And yourself? Not too bad. What does it mean that it's always very... It's a British way of saying, yeah, not terrible, not amazing, just things are happening. <laughs> To be fair, I think we say not too bad when things are terrible and when things are amazing as well. So That's why I'm asking, because I was living for a year in Australia when I was a student and it, not bad was also, and it, the spectrum of not bad could be like, oh, I just had a bad shower in the morning to, to, oh, I'm really sad. The other one that my wife really gets annoyed by is, and many other people, British people say it's all right about things. So I'll be eating some food. So what's it like? I'll say, yeah, it's all right. That either means it's all right, actually it's really terrible, or it's, yeah, all right, that's pretty amazing. So it can mean any of those things. <laughs> it's fine, either means it's okay. Or it's It's shit. fine, but <laughs> you need to start again. <laughs> Larissa, are you British yourself? No, I'm Brazilian. <laughs> ah. No, I live in Brazil. Yeah. Ah, okay. Where south. in Brazil? In, more in the south is in Iceland which is called Florianopolis. It's amazing here. Okay. And how do you manage you, you guys, the time zones and everything? Larissa tends to start at 2 p.m. my time, and I tend to work all the time. <laughs> I wake up early, and when it did, I stay longer, so that's okay. Let's start with an introduction of you, who you are, and I would say ladies first, although you are the Atomic Research founder or brain behind it, but Larissa, who are you? What are you doing? I work as a UX researcher and sex manager with Dan at Glimlet. As I said, I'm from Brazil, so I'm not a native Portuguese speaker. I also have a degree in social sciences, and I am currently doing my PhD in anthropology. I'm passionate about urban mobility, so this is what my thesis is about, but I really love everything related to qualitative research, and yeah, that's how I started working with UX research. And I worked for the past two years in a big company. It was a betting and gaming company from UK, mm -hmm. and I just joined at Blingly two months ago, <laughs> so I'm pretty excited working with them. And Daniel, who are you? I'm Daniel Pidcock. I am a UX designer and researcher and have been since before I knew that was a thing. So I've been working in product design and creating, especially focusing on digital products for probably about 20 years now. And in around 2015, um, I was struggling with the problem of managing knowledge in a big company and was, was looking for a, a solution and along with side other people created the concept of atomic UX research as a way to make knowledge scalable. And that became my life for the last <laughs> however many years now, about eight years. So how did you come up with atomic research? Right? So the situation was the company I was working with really struggled with, with knowledge. We had lots of research that was stored in reports. And these reports would get written and then put into Google Drive. In fact, we used to call it Google Grave because it's where research went to die. We knew they would probably never see it again. <laughs> this was a problem we always complained about, but I ended up founding the accessibility team in that, that company. And of course, with accessibility, very rarely do you have a piece of research just on accessibility. It does happen, but it's rare. 
but almost every other project would have some knowledge around accessibility. So we had the problem that we'd have massive long reports with maybe just a tiny little nugget of gold that we wanted to pull out um, mm -hmm. about that. And trying to gather all of this information across a massive company with many brands across the world with quite a small, mostly voluntary accessibility team was a massive problem. And we thought there must be a better way. As the name suggests, we were actually inspired by a, the atomic design process. And I was having this discussion with someone the other day who was talking about whether it's good to be a generalist or a specialist in UX. And I said, I can really see the value in being a specialist, being so focused on your craft and knowing every little tiny thing about it. But if I didn't have a broad knowledge across to research knowledge around that is a problem we have in knowledge management and there there has been a solution for something completely different in design systems I wouldn't have seen the connection between those and in fact it was a colleague of mine that I was talking to that was drawing something on a board and I was like wait a minute that looks a little bit like atomic design oh maybe actually that was that solved a problem there maybe that could solve a problem here and I started talking to other people in the organization we started talking to people outside the organization we actually even roped in a couple of teams that I knew were struggling with a similar thing in other companies not competitive companies but still other companies to see right we're talking about this what do you think and getting lots and lots of input from probably hundreds of UX specialists and knowledge, from knowledge management to skilled people to to just generalists as well. So bringing all that knowledge together is how we managed to refine the process and to think, actually, there is something here. There's something really special here, in fact. This is the point where let's introduce maybe what is atomic research, because I have to be honest, I didn't know about it. Larissa, what is atomic research? Atomic research, it's a simple process with four distinct parts that creates molecules of knowledge. Usually we call these four parts as experiments, facts, insights, and recommendations. And the main concept behind this approach, as the name implies, is to deconstruct the research findings into smaller units. So it allows for easy and efficient consumption. And it also means research democratization, which is something that we consider very important. And that's why the name is called like atomic, because each individual piece of knowledge acquired through the process is referred to as an atom. And how do these atoms come together? In its inception, what we recognized is one of the problems we had is that insights were too closely aligned with how they were discovered. And that's why when you try to pull an insight out of a report, it lost that context. So what we did is break down the components into a piece of knowledge into its atoms so how we learned something how we learned the facts was separate to what we think it meant what the cause or the effect of those facts are and they, that added the benefit that we could actually connect atoms of knowledge from all around the organization so i might have a customer observation or quote and I'd be going, okay, look, I think there's something here. Do we have any data to back that up? And I could connect to that to create an insight. And I might have other data elsewhere that actually I could connect negatively that would go, actually, this makes me think that might not be correct. How can we add more knowledge to confirm whether it's correct or not? We can keep on building, keep on adding evidence on one side of the chain and building our confidence on whether this is true or not. And it also means that we can have one or several pieces of evidence and have several different ideas about it as well so we could have one fact and have several ideas about the cause or effect of that and create several insights and the same for recommendations so once we've got an insight we want to decide what we want to do about it or come up with some ideas of what we used to call conclusions but we felt that was too definite so we now refer to it as recommendations so we know this and we think this is the right solution probably we're going to test that and that will create new experiments, new facts, either back up the insights we've got already, disprove those insights, maybe create new ones as well. So it creates this really beautiful network of interconnecting, quite holistic view of what we know, and what we don't know. And you start with these experiments. How do you define them? So the term experiment, and so I think one thing that comes up a lot in UX is terminology and we're not <laughs> very 
tied to terminology. And in fact, in the software that we produced around this, the tooling that we produce called Gleanly, we've actually got the option to be able to change that terminology. So what we try to tend to call it is experiments. That's probably the most commonly changed because experiment sounds very formal, doesn't it? But it just basically means that this is the thing we did to create this knowledge. So that could be a formal experiment. It could be a user test or an A-B test or a survey or something like that. But it could be I overheard someone talking on the bus. It could be that my developers have told me or people in customer service are saying customers are struggling with this. That's evidence, right? And now I want to go off and actually speak to some customers or look at some data to bring more confidence around that. But that's still evidence, right? Some people might call facts findings. I like facts because we want to really define that these should be factual. It's not our opinion. There's no room for opinion when it comes to facts. It's what the data is telling us. Whereas insights, we can really think about whether it's we can come up with quite crazy ideas if we want to, as long as we can find data to make them seem less crazy. <laughs> and we can even start with insights or recommendations and work backwards. I quite often would say to people, if you've got a hypothesis, if it's actionable, you could put it in as a recommendation, or if it's an assertion, like I believe our customers prefer cats to dogs. It's not actionable, but I haven't really got any evidence around it. It's just a feeling, a gut feeling. Okay, I've got that insight as a hypothesis. Let's go and see if we've got any data already. And if not, what we can do to try and get some more confidence around that. And now you were mentioning hypothesis. And this is something that I am contemplating in the last weeks, having some clients who are very mature when it comes to research and having some clients who are just in the beginning of the journey if to torture them with hypothesis or if you go more into the direction of ground the theory and just collecting stuff, what would you say? How does atomic research put that together? Do you have to have those hypotheses and do you have to have those assumptions? I think the best way to think about it is a lightweight framework. So there are definitely teams in which they're completely evidence-led. If there isn't any data for it, they won't create those insights. But even then, when you've got data, and there's no such thing as absolute proof, right? So we're already guessing when we're making an assertion, when we're making an insight or a recommendation, because we might have more evidence later. And we go, God, like, why did we think that was true? All the data was pointing that way, but that wasn't actually the truth of it. And of course, sometimes our data can be wrong. We could have done a survey and it's really clear the outcome, but perhaps people were just ticking the first box on the survey, for example. I don't know. I definitely think there are teams that they always start with the findings first. They start with the experiment, create facts and generate insights and recommendations. That's probably the most common process starting from left. to. But I think it's important when you're trying to create really exciting pro products to be a human and, and be intuitive. And I'm, I can't, one of the things I like about this framework is it doesn't force you, it doesn't force you to disregard your human instincts. Mm -hmm. It allows people to come up with ideas. And in fact, I think it encourages it because one of the things is it can be very easy when a customer says this or a customer does this and we go, okay, then we should do that. The customer can't find the button, so we'll move it. Okay, so that's the fact and that's the recommendation. What's the insight? What's the reason for that? What's the reason they're struggling to find it? And what's the reason that we think put, moving the button is the solution to that? And actually trying to put that into words. So often customers, I'll be training someone on this and they will say, oh, it's obvious, isn't it? And I'm like, if it's obvious, it's going to be easy to write this insight but it isn't, is it? <laughs> you have to think like, <laughs> why is the button over there better? I instinctively know it is, but okay, maybe if we say it's because that's the way the eye travels or something, we're reading left to right. Okay, then we're creating quite an interesting insight there. Call to actions are better in this place because of reading angle. So hypo hypothetically, if it was Arabic reader, it should be on the opposite side. Is that right? We can start really thinking, things start becoming more interesting quite often more innovative and more effective decisions come out the other end of it. I like two things that you are saying, and there's no question. So sorry for that, but I just like to think out loud here. One is the fact that you were mentioning facts and not findings. I love it because sometimes, especially when I'm talking to my technical colleagues, they just don't consider qualitative findings to be facts. And changing the terminology might make a change. We'll, we'll definitely try it out. Wording is that. And the second is that you are mentioning the intuition and the intuitive character because this is something I kind of blame sometimes my design colleagues especially in bigger companies corporation where they tend to use user research 
as a kind of defense against politics and opinion and stuff like that. I'm like, use your designer intuition and make an argument on a design level. You have that intuition. You just lost it somewhere in the process of deciding if the button should be like there or uh, green or orange. Now the question is coming. And you were also pointing out that the insight is something which is gluing facts and recommendation. But let's go a little bit back. How does a fact become an insight? Because this is a never ending, in at least in my opinion, never ending story when it comes to researchers. When you say, how does a fact become the insight? Do you mean like physically, like how does that happen? Or what is the process to create creating an insight? What do you think? How does a fact become an insight in your opinion? Because I actually never had it summarized and okay and a finding or fact becomes an insight because it's there's this interpretation and I'm always also doing it in a way that I put the findings I even use tables to sort it out this is the finding we can solve it this way and then I do the last piece in my report where it's insights and I always put mm. it's researcher interpretation and I know unconsciously yeah. how it's happening for me because I have it from the observation and especially when it's a client or a company that I was working for a longer time, you are picking up the clues through the studies that you are doing. How would you define is this process happening for you? I think in the end, this, first of all, there's no right or wrong way, but I think actually in, in the model, in the atomic model, the term insight could be a synonym for what you're talking, saying as an interpretation, right? Normally a fact is one of the struggles sometimes with creating a fact is sometimes it is a summarization of the findings. And that obviously has the risk of including interpretation and bias. Normally people would use an insight as the summarization of all these facts. But what I encourage is to include on top of that so for instance, we've got all of these facts and that tells me the button is in the wrong place. Now that's fine as an insight, but it's very tactical and it's not very interesting and it doesn't really lead anywhere. But if we add on that cause and or effect, you know, the button is in the wrong place because of this, and this is having that effect, that is suddenly becomes a much more interesting insight and something we can work off. And that's why we might have several insights going, I think the buttons on the wrong place because of this i think it's because of that i think if we did this it would cause this etc cetera, etc cetera. so it starts a much more interesting conversation than just a sim simple statement and, and makes and opens the mind a little bit in there but it would be perfectly reasonable to to treat to not go to that detail if that makes sense and thinking about a discussion that i had with nikki anderson she was also mentioning that sometimes, depending on the context or what kind of study it was, sometimes you are not even having insights. For example, especially in usability studies, like going into big psychological insights doesn't make sense, if, especially if it's one study, but if it's more, then you might have something bigger. And do you rely that these four components have to come every time, or are you in atomic research? more flexible or relaxed about, okay, it might have fact, it might have the recommendations, but maybe the insights will come after a longer time. The insights are good to think about them. It's good to have it on the structure. And in Lily, we use it. So you're not possible to add recommendations that are not linked to insights. Could you maybe explain more how you do it? Yeah, so it's very interesting because I had the same question and this is a very common question that we have with our customers, they always ask if it's necessary to have the insight, to think about insights that um, are not linked to recommendations, if it's not possible to just add the recommendations as you suggested. And I had the same feeling in the beginning and then uh, explained to me, oh, just try to add insights because it, it will make you think about the process and think about the whys. And when I was trying Lily for the first time, Daniel suggested me just to add some, yeah, just to add things there on the platform and to think about the whole process. And I found it very interesting and very important as well, because yes, it's, it makes you think, it makes you, you think about the whole process and all the research. And it's very useful because sometimes you don't perceive, but you are 
a little bit lazy and you already know the recommendations that you want to make. But when you're thinking about the insights, it makes you think like more deeper into that problem. I really like what you are saying about you are looking for the why is it happening. Mm-hmm. It's definitely something that sometimes I'm missing. Okay, but st- let's stop here. Let's be mindful of why are things happening. But on the other side, to contradict myself <laughs> right away, <laughs> it's also that it it could have a very good role in triggering more discussions in the team and trying to understand the users or the humans using the products but it's also creating more and more assumptions. How not to just running in a circle, I would say. What would be your recommendation there? I think I mean, it's sort of the same because I think it's not a problem to run in circles because you don't need to have a finish for the research. Of course, you have recommendations and you work on it, but then you can test these recommendations again and it's an ongoing process and you are always finding new stuff about that. So I don't think it's really a problem. And I think the other thing to really consider is one of our main focuses through this is always the decision maker. So mm-hmm. it's obviously it's very, as a process, it was designed to solve the problem of scaling knowledge. And the solution was making a really useful synthesis process. And there's a lot of people who use it just for synthesis. They've got no interest in creating a repository or growing a knowledge base. But the reason it's effective for that is a it makes you think about it a little bit deeper but also the end point is that we have a recommendation that is really clear how that's connected to how the thought process works i know this isn't useful for podcast but i'm going to share my screen if you want to check out the video daniel is just showing us please visit our social media and also the web page of this podcast on uxtweak.com slash podcast For those that can't see the screen here, what we're looking at is what we would refer to as a molecule, an atomic molecule. Some people might refer to as a nugget because of the great work that Thomas Sharon's done on the subject. But basically what we're looking at is is a knowledge molecule from the perspective of a recommendation. So we've got a recommendation here and connected to it, we can see two insights that are connected positively with these green lines. And these are the the thinking that supports this is the reason we're making this recommendation. We can also connect things negatively as well. These are the reasons we might consider not doing this, or at least consider things we need to take into account. And then each one of these is also then connected. So we have the recommendation. This is what we want, want someone to decide on. This is the thinking behind that. This is the reason we're making that recommendation. And here's the evidence for those insights. And once again, we will have these are grouped by experiment, by source. So facts always belong to an experiment because mm-hmm. how you learn something is intrinsically connected to, to what you learn, right? You can't separate those two at all. I can see here I've got a moderated user test with customers saying there are things that support these insights and things that go against it as well. We use the term disproves, even though it's quite final. I've also got A-B tests and all sorts of different types of source that will help me gain confidence of whether to trust these insights or not. So as a decision maker, I can say, right, I am I can understand why you're thinking this. I can also see holistically why I might choose not to. And also I can gain a confidence level uh, around this. And it might be that I don't have enough confidence. I might say to the researcher, sorry, you're going to have to go back and do some more. I've got gaps in my knowledge here. I've got gaps in my in the research, or I just don't have enough of it. I'm not confident enough at this stage as well. So they're able to. So this relates to your original question in that, yes, we could always be creating assertions. We could always be gather, chasing our tail, looking for more evidence, to, but there's going to be a stage where we're confident enough to make decisions on subject. Mm-hmm. And then of course, once to so the decision in here with, with this example, which is to offer free shipping, the answer is we've got enough confidence to do an AB test now. So we test that in the UK and we can see, did that work or not? And we can see, yes, it worked. It cost us some money, but we made money from it. So we're confident that worked. Probably really happy to roll that out permanently in the UK. So now it's given us the confidence to test it in France and Italy, et cetera. And we might find, look, it it does work in the UK and France, but it doesn't work in Italy for some reason. Now, why is that? Is there something culturally in, in Italy that I don't understand as a British person? Yeah, okay, let's speak to some customers, gather some evidence about that. And I can bring that to bear. It helps build this node of knowledge around free shipping in different countries. 
it might mm -hmm. also help me to learn other things that I wasn't expecting as well. And that creates new insights. There's different ways of approaching selling products in Italy, for example. <laughs> Does that make sense? It makes sense. I was a little bit struggling when we were talking about talking, for like another framework. I'm sometimes really tired of all the frameworks that researchers mm -hmm. come up with. I'm like, oh, and it's the same thing that market research showed us a hundred years ago. But if I see it now, it's facts where the experiments are listed, then it's coming to into the insights and then a final recommendation is made. And I see that you are saying, okay, three experiments and then the insight is built out of that. And I see the framework as very beneficial, especially for let's call it continuous research, because it actually goes back. And this is what I'm trying to do sometimes with my clients, if I have a chance or in the companies that I was working, doing research also on a meta level, like not just taking out one study and being like, oh, we have to do this, but going back and forth and really, okay, these three studies tell us that we have to do that, or this is the insight. And this is what I like about it, that it's bringing the sources are from different studies, not just one. And it's not just sucked out of a finger. Sorry for the expression. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah and that's absolutely one of the big powers is if I've got an idea, I've got some facts, I've got an, in, an idea of what I think that insight is. I might be able to find other research from a different part of the company that suddenly tells us whether that's true or not. I've actually got an example here based on a real use case, if I can remember mm -hmm. it was. So we, I was a long time ago now speaking to one of our customers and they were having the question about, they'd done a survey, they'd learned this information and it was, I've changed the details, but it was around our customers have told us that they prefer green clothing above other colors. And they said, so is that a fact was an insight? And I said, I believe it's a fact because it's a fact that the survey told us that. We might find other evidence elsewhere that tells us that isn't true. So we've got the survey here, 74%, 64% of respondents claim they prefer green clothing. We may also go and look to see what is the national standard? Is that unusually high? Which we can see it is. But also, okay, but is that borne out by actual data? So luckily they had access to their sales data. They're able to see, yeah, actually 44% of their items sold fall into the green spectrum. That's so much higher than any other type of clothing they're selling. Okay, so we've got two bits of data here that's starting to give us confidence there's a thing going on, right? We don't know why yet because it's all quantitative. We haven't done any qualitative. We need to go and speak to some customers and find out why that is. In the meantime, do an A-B test on the homepage and swap out the picture on the homepage to some lovely green clothing because we might sell some more. I didn't actually, I don't remember what the result of that was exactly, but I know they had a significant uplift as a result of that change. They still don't understand why this is. So I don't know whether it's something they can make assertions. Perhaps our branding is particularly attractive to people who love the color green. Their logo wasn't green, so I don't know why it could be that. <laughs> Maybe there's something about their marketing, something about the demographics that they naturally... I don't, we have no idea at this stage. We can start making insights. And of course, that's going to determine how we, we can test those insights as well. I think it might be to do with our branding. Okay, let's create a recommendation that we can test around. Maybe we do some color variants or go to a branding specialist company. I don't know. But it starts asking those questions and allows us to start thinking about why is this? And also, what's the effect? Is this a problem because we're excluding all those people who love red clothes and blue clothes? Or actually, have we got a niche here, something we can really focus in on and become like the green clothing people? We can start <laughs> asking more interesting questions as a result of this. What would be also interesting to know how many people had a color or blindness or color insensitiveness to know like how people perceive also the colors, but that's just me geeking out. Okay. But yeah, you've got, you suddenly, there's a seam of gold there that we can start. Yeah, with. definitely. Uh, whereas before it could have been, oh, that was interesting. We didn't expect to find that on the survey moving on by moving it into facts and calling out, okay, so what does, what is the cause of this and what's the effect mm. of that? it raises those questions in a really effective manner to start yeah. turning into something useful, potentially. Not always, yeah. of course, not everything you find is going to be useful, but <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I also am interested in, just enough to say yes and no, and Larissa, I'm also interested in your opinion about it because it doesn't seem like a linear process when it comes to atomic research. It's like back and forth. And that could be chaotic. How is it for somebody new coming to atomic research to actually understand this little 
piece of chaos, which is then giving structure, but it's still a little bit like it's not linear. Yeah, I, it, for me, it's very common to do research in a non-linear way. So it, yeah, I think it makes more sense because if you have a structure, like a fixed structure, you have to think about it and you can get out of it. So for me, it makes more sense when it's not linear. One of the things we found is that there's lots of researchers that use this just as a synthesis process, like I mentioned earlier, but probably the people, the organizations get the most value out of this, organizations in which they've got lots of non-researchers doing research. And there is a small learning curve that they have to get over non-researchers to understand it, but it is quite a low wall to, to jump over. But what it gives them then is a really good, flexible framework to work within and makes it easy to differentiate what they've learned with what they believe, for example, and give them confidence in, in, in what they're learning and being able to reuse, reuse and benefit from other people's knowledge as well and gather things together really well. Mm. So the non, and I suppose also encouraging retesting as well. I think that's a benefit. It's, it's non-linear. It is a circle. And I think that's one of the positives it encourages. It's not a case that we've learned that, right, we made a decision, move on and forget about it. We, it's a case of, yeah, we need to test that and check that. And we're always learning as we're going. And I think that's actually quite natural. It's quite human. And one of the mistakes I made in the early days, is, and it's probably very clear with the term atomic UX research, is I assumed this was a user research problem. It isn't. It's a knowledge problem. And knowledge affects every part of an organization. And so I think very much in digital terms, the developers on our team, they're operating with knowledge, you know, and they'll yeah. be when they start a project, they're researching, it might be the code rather than, or approaches and different architecture rather than the user needs, but actually even being aware of why we're doing this is a really powerful thing. And for them to be able to bring like, this is possible to the table and be involved in those discussions. One of the questions you asked on the preparation, I think was what point does a researcher stop? Do they just do the facts or do they go all the way through to recommendations? And the answer is it depends on the organization. Sometimes they are just delivering recommendations, uh, just the facts and other people picking up insights or picking up recommendations, but it works best when everybody's collaborating, everyone's yeah. bringing knowledge together. Everyone's got the opportunity to go. I've got an idea of why that might be. I've got an inkling or I've got some evidence elsewhere. I've already solved that problem with a different project. And then conversations start happening. Innovation starts happening. And it's a beautiful thing. We are getting into the recommendation spaces because we speak to the customers a lot. But the recommendations should be definitely, as you said, uh, something that everybody is working on. But how much do you think you both shouldn't research to go into the ideation, either in a facilitation role or even with the ideas, because the recommendation is also a different thing than an idea. And I don't want to hang too much on the terminology, but you know where I'm going, probably, hopefully. <laughs> this is interesting because it's very related to what Dan already said, but because we don't think that researchers always have to create both the text, this, then synthesize the insights and then make recommendations. It doesn't need to be always the case, but we also don't think that researchers can help on ide in ideation as well. I used to do it a lot on the company that I worked with before Glenly. So for example, sometimes it could be that researchers only provide the facts and maybe designers or project managers synthesize insights and make recommendations, or it might be that researchers make the facts and also create insights and someone else make recommendations. Yeah, this is very open and our device is any of those could be the case, but it shouldn't be any person's responsibility. So anyone should be able to create facts, to deliver evidence. Anyone should be able to come up with ideas in the form of insights, for example, and anyone should be able to make recommendations as well. So this is what we believe. And this is related to the research democratization that I talked before, but Another important thing to, to highlight is that probably there will be somebody that has the authority to approve those recommendations. My final question would be, where can people follow you both? Where can people find you? So they can maybe try it out. If you are like 
organizing any workshops or trainings? How can people approach that and sign up for that? Because this is something that probably might need a little practice. We are on LinkedIn and you can follow us as Glenly and as Larissa and Daniel Pitcock as well. And we are always posting there because we are doing once a week a public webinar to present atomic research and to, present, to talk about Glealing and Glealing features. And we are, our orientation is always to do that. So just follow us on LinkedIn and you'll see the next ones and you can just do it. Thanks. You could also do a search on Google or YouTube and you'll see some talks and some articles from us as well. And yeah, so we're doing the talks and if anyone, the process of Atomic can probably be done with most tools that people have already. We have built a specific tool for it. There were certain things we wanted to be able to do that just wasn't possible using things like Airtable and such. And if anyone fancies giving that a go, that's uh, gleam.ly and there's a 30 day free trial on there. Great. Thank you. Obrigada for your energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a wrap. Thank you for listening to UX Research Geeks. If you liked this episode, don't forget to share it with your friends, leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, and subscribe to stay updated when a new episode comes out. This podcast was brought to you by UX Tweak, an all-in-one UX research tool. Thank you.